Every school kid uh, has heard the story of a frog and a pot of water and a stove, right? The horrible story, you put a frog in a pot of water, and if you heat it up slowly enough, the story goes, the poor frog, there's something about its nervous system, it doesn't quite realize it's in danger until it's too late, and the poor frog will boil to death. Well, surely that's an alarmist, overstated metaphor for our climate problem, <laughs> dead frogs and all. Uh, well, I don't know. Um, if you ask some of the uh, more uh, virulent environmentalists in the world, like Mark Carney, governor of the Bank of England, has pointed out lately that we're so late to the game on this problem that we need to leave roughly three quarters of our known fossil fuel reserves in the ground, unburned, stranded assets, if we are to have a 50-50 shot, a coin tosses shot, of stopping below that two degree danger zone. Those assets sit those reserves sit on the balance sheets of energy companies whose stock prices reflect the idea they will all be burned, discounted net present value and all that kind of stuff. So the market is telling us very clearly that we are going to roar past two degrees. The peer-reviewed science on this stuff is truly frightening. Don't think of it as temperature so much as energy. We are trapping the energy equivalent over and above normal of 400,000 Atomic bombs in the atmosphere and oceans every day. Business as usual will destabilize our climate in ways that we cannot imagine. So we are certainly headed for a very, very hot pot, so I think it's a very, it's a very apt metaphor. The actions we take are nowhere near what we need to take. Uh, but I think it's an interesting metaphor, because I, for one, don't want to go so, darkly, so, so quickly into that dark night. I'd like to solve the problem. Um, so I'm interested in waking up that frog. So for me, it's interesting because just like there are rules of that frog's physiology that lock it into place, I think there are rules about our systems, our cognitive systems, our cultural systems, our economic systems, lurking beneath the surface, beneath all that noise that lock us into place. And if we can find out what those rules are, we can presumably change them and spring into action. The story is roughly, it's very difficult for our minds to take on board a belief in the trouble that we're in. When we do figure it out, we feel like our hands are tied because we've got to make a living, like everybody else. And we're subject to market forces, like the rest of the world. And if we buck those market forces to solve the problem, the last gasp of the, of the skeptic, it will cost too much. Well, let's start with how we think. We are all, all of us, myself included, to some extent in denial about this problem. When I say denial, I don't just mean those who say it's not true active denial. There will always be people who need to be dragged kicking and screaming in the 21st century. Don't want to accept the science. It's the free world. More pernicious, I think, is what I call passive denial. Where if asked, someone would say, yes, I think it's a problem. The scientists are right. I am worried about it. But we go about our day-to-day -day lives as if it weren't the deep and profound existential threat that it is. Right? Ignoring a problem is a kind of denial. And we're all in that state. We've been sleepwalking through this problem for 20 years. Now, the environmental movement's response has been often to say, well, if we only got the right information out there, right, through the noise, get the Margaret Wentys of the world out of the way, have a scientifically literate conversation in our national papers, and maybe we would act on that belief. While I think it's necessary to have that scientifically literate conversation, I don't think it's sufficient. It's not sufficient because it assumes we're rational, and we're not. We're wonderfully irrational, we're humans. The mind has really two modes of operation. Conscious, unconscious, slow, fast, thoughtful, intuitive. Those delineations mean roughly the same thing. And our thinking is completely dominated by unconscious thinking, even though by definition, of course, we're not aware of it. Our brains are not computers, they're neural networks. And from the day we're born, throughout our lives, it's forming hardwired connections between associated ideas, words, events, concepts, and so on. And over our lifetime, that billions of connections form a network, it's unconscious, automatic, hardwired, based on experience, that becomes our common sense. It becomes our worldview. We take it with us everywhere to go to make sense of the world in ways computers cannot. Right? It preconditions the way we approach new ideas, new beliefs. Right? It's the thing that makes us human. And it contains many cultural norms embedded in with that. And one of the cultural norms it contains, which I would say is endemic in the Western world, is that of progress. Right? The future is better than the past. Human ingenuity knows no bounds. 
The market can grow forever. Ever since Sir Francis Bacon talked about opposable thumbs and a rational mind, nature is ours to control. And look, at the dawn of the 21st century, they all look roughly right. I'm not saying these beliefs are false. There's a reason they're deeply embedded in our worldviews because they've served us very well until now. The problem is that climate disruption is incompatible with that fundamental notion of progress, right? And your brain, my brain, everybody's brain, will play all kinds of tricks to keep that new belief at bay because it's an uncomfortable new belief and it threatens your worldview. They're called cognitive biases, they're measurable, they're real, but they're like attack dogs. The gates of your mind to keep uncomfortable beliefs that upset the apple cart of your common sense on the ground. That upset the apple cart. <clears throat> the problem can be solved, I think. That's why people get so angry when you talk about climate disruption, right? It causes cognitive dissonance. Two incompatible beliefs being held in the mind at the same time causes discomfort. That's why people get so angry about climate. You're threatening their worldview. The solution, I think, is not more information. I think what we can do, if we paint a picture of what the world looks like if we solve this problem, clean, abundant energy underwritten by an economic stimulus that comes from rebuilding an energy infrastructure based on finite resources to one based on technology, that speaks to the best of us. Innovative, resilient, future-looking, nation-building. It also happens to be possible, it happens to be true. You know, uh, uh, Professor Jacobson down at Stanford is doing some great work, very detailed state-by-state -state analysis of how to decouple the economy from fossil fuels without breaking the bank. Canada's in this game already. Did you know we employ more people in clean tech in this country than we do in the oil sands? Now. And at Mar my day job is to invest private capital in and build the next generation of clean energy companies. And believe me, Canada has some great horses in this race. Next generation nuclear, energy storage, smart grid, biofuels. This is something we're already participating in. So my point is this. If we can paint a picture of the solution such that it speaks to the best of ourselves, we then are more likely to endorse and believe in the fact that the problem is as bad as it is. So that's how I think we work with our cognitive biases and with our worldview. Well, that's all very nice. Sounds like a happy picture. What about those three quarters of the fossil fuel reserves you have to leave in the ground? So an enlightened CEO comes to work one day and says, ah, I saw this talk, I totally get it now. <laughs> we need to leave three quarters of our reserves in the ground. Let's start by doing our share. What would happen to that CEO? She would be fired on the spot. <laughs> the board of directors would have no choice but to fire that enlightened CEO. It's their fiduciary obligation. And when fiduciary obligation bumps up against personal conscience in a corporate environment, it's fiduciary obligation that wins every single time it's written into corporate law. So we should expect, it should be no surprise, to find fossil fuel companies fighting to the bitter end for their right, their rational right, to burn the reserves they have on their balance sheet. They have to. So what do we do? We need to change the rules of the game to give those enlightened CEOs, and there's many of them, some room to maneuver, such that their fiduciary obligation is aligned with building a low-carbon economy. BP and Shell have said globally, change the rules. What they're saying is, help me. I cannot help but burn all my reserves. <laughs> right? They know what's up. But as soon as you start talking about changing the rules of the game, you run up against what I call the myth of the free market. What do I mean by that? Well, it goes as, as follows. In order to be maximally efficient, the market must be left free of interference to find equilibrium where supply meets demand, goods are infinitely substitutable, happiness is maximized, and unfettered self-interest takes us there. This is Adam Smith through to the Chicago School. Why do I call it a myth? Well, first of all, all markets require structure of some kind. At the very least, contract law and maybe capital constraints on banks. <laughs> Second, so it's a matter of degree, not free or not free. Second, most of the wealth we have around us today, the dawn of the 21st century, was not the result exclusively of the market operating by itself. It was always a subtle collaboration between public interest and private interest. Nuclear, aerospace, the internet, automotive, none of those industries came about de novo in the private sector. It was always of strategic importance to the public sector as well, who enabled the growth of those industries. Third, Unfettered self-interest can be enormously self-destructive. John Galbraith made hay out of this. We just watched the financial sector drive off a cliff chasing dollar bills. <laughs> There's no Fed to catch us 
if we allow the unfettered self-interest of our energy companies, who have to do this, try to burn all their reserves. So it's not a matter of free or equilibrium. It's a matter of what kind of structure is best suited to build a low-carbon economy. So free and equilibrium aren't useful. And there are concepts that are left over from out-of-date math back in the 18th century. Nothing of interest operates at equilibrium. It's stasis. It kind of, maybe the price of sugar is in equilibrium, but certainly not the economy as a whole. Everything of interest we study, from weather systems to neural networks to cells to plants to social networks, operate far from equilibrium. That's why they're interesting. So a modern view of the economy views it as billions of people and companies transacting at a basic level according to some set of rules. Out of that emerges this highly complex, evolving, dynamic system called the global economy. There's nothing like equilibrium here. Change and innovation are endemic. The microchip enables the computer, enables the internet, enables Facebook, enables a new economic law called the law of increasing returns due to the network effect. So the very rules of the game change as innovation rolls through the system. There's nothing like equilibrium here. And the modern language of evolutionary economics cashes all that stuff out in some detail. The punchline is there is nothing that matches for creative potential the modern global market. It is inherently and deeply unpredictable. You cannot pick winners and losers. Yet there is coherence over time, patterns sustain over time, which means you can set a general direction. Four, it's path dependent. What happens first enables or constrains what happens later. Without a microchip, you haven't got Facebook. The establishment of King Coal inhibits market reforms because you have entrenched infrastructure and entrenched interests. Right? What happens before affects what happens later. The punchline is when you say, well, what kind of structure is best to solve our climate problem? You want to affect the rules at the, at the level of transaction, at the lowest level in this complex system as you can. And then you will both harness the market, harness the market by, by constraining it in some way, but at the same time unleashing its creative potential. You harness it and unleash its, its creative potential. And there is no policy option that does it like a price on carbon. And there are reasons for this, which I've briefly alluded to in this sort of modern description of how the economy evolves over time. A price on carbon is like gravity in this picture. If the market is the water, you can't predict where an individual molecule will end up. You can't predict the patterns that will take place in that water, but you can bet the water's going to end up at the bottom of the hill. Right? So too in a, an economy where you've priced carbon. You don't know who's going to win or lose or how we're going to get there, but you know we're going to end up in a low carbon state because you've asked that evolutionary complex system to solve for that constraint. So that's why pricing carbon is so important. Well, that's nice, Tom, <clears throat> but it's going to cost a lot. <laughs> we have economic models that try to do a cost-benefit analysis on climate policy. They're called dice and rice. I think it's a mugs game. It's, we can capture the costs pretty well, but the benefits are really the benefits of keeping the ecosystem in the same state, roughly, that our industrial civilization evolved in. The problem is that the uncertainties in the science linking the science to effects, linking the effects to economic activity, swamp quantitative analysis, or attempts at quantitative analysis. Right? Uncertainty is where the monsters lie. It's not risk. Risk is well behaved. Risk, you know the probability of an event, and you know the outcome. There's a risk my house will burn down. Ask my insurance company what it is. Uncertainty is different. What is the... Uh, probability and geopolitical implications of China's rice crops failing three years in a row when we hit three degrees Celsius. No idea. Probably bad. What's the implications of a nuclear-armed Pakistan running out of water? Pretty bad. The American Southwest turning to desert, as we're watching happen in California right now. Pretty bad. So there are ways to improve these models. I have many suggestions as to how to do it, but I think it's the wrong language actually, the quantitative analysis. My favorite philosopher of science, Nancy Cartwright, has an example. You take a piece of paper about this big, you hold it over your head in a windy day from the top of a building in downtown London, and you let it go. You say, where will it end up? Those committed to a quantitative analysis will begin churning calculations about gravity and wind shear and three-dimensional maps and so on. They'll have nothing of interest to tell you. 
The uncertainties swamp the calculations. A social scientist would look at that and say, it looks like a 20-pound note. I bet it ends up in somebody's pocket. <laughs> Behind that glib example is a deep truth. And that deep truth is that sometimes foggy generalizations, statements in everyday English, folk psychology, capture truth conditions better than quantitative analysis. And I think that's the case in climate. So when we talk about what does it cost, well, first of all, if you ask what's at stake, everything. What does it cost? Think of it as insurance. Let's pretend there's no benefits. Let's not try to count the reasons why we should do it. Let's just say, what does it cost to stand or two degrees? and buy that insurance. Well, if you ask someone like the International Energy Agency, fairly reasonable people, it will cost about a donut and a coffee per week per person to stay under 450 parts per million. If you ask the recalcitrant skeptics of the world, right, the Lomborgs and the American Enterprise Institute, who are really shrill about how much it costs and why we shouldn't do it, so worst case scenario, what do they think it costs? No benefits. No jobs being created, building this new infrastructure, no valued ecosystems being set, just cost. Just paying an insurance premium. 1% of global GDP. I think that sounds like a pretty good deal to me. And I think the public understands that's a pretty good deal when you explain it in those terms. We sit now in a time of unprecedented wealth. The amount of capital sloshing around our markets is in the tens of trillions doing nothing unprecedented amounts of science and innovation and engineering, manufacturing capacity. We could solve this problem if we wanted to. Unlike that poor frog, we humans uniquely can choose the rules by which we live. We have self-determination. There's just one thing we need to do before that happens, and that's wake up. That's it. Thank you very much.